right. Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Doing all right? Everybody dried out or getting ready to get wet all week, it sounds like. I was talking to Paul Askew. We were up here yesterday with the, um, the cleanup, and he's like, I got to get home. I got to mow. I'm thinking, yeah, because if you didn't mow yesterday, I don't know when you're going to get it mowed. But hey, good morning. Welcome. It's great seeing everybody here this morning at Gravity Baptist Church. Uh, definitely want to welcome any visitors that we may have. Thank you for coming by and worshiping with us this morning and ask that you stop by one of our information tables um, after the service. We have a little gift to give to you and um, want to collect some information um, from you as well. But um, before we really get started with um, some of the typical announcements, we want to invite C.J. Pruitt up here. C.J. Um, has some information that she wants to share about the Women on Missions group that we have. And so, um, C.J., I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Tim. Um, so we have a, a women on mission um, group here at our church. It's open to all ladies, uh, just in case we have a mixed audience. Um, we do mean Lord made females here. Um, just just to just throw it out there. Um, it's open to, to women of, of all ages. Uh, we meet on the first Tuesday of every month from 6 p.m. to roughly 7, 720. Um, and essentially, it's a great time for the women of the church to get out and to fellowship together and, and to put some, some hands and feet on um, some, some outreach opportunities that, that we can do for the Lord so that we can do our part to help spread the gospel. Um, that's something that we're, we're very passionate about. Uh, we're not about doing good just for the sake of, of having something to do. What we really focus on is, is spreading the gospel. That, that's, what we're really, um, that's what we're really focused on this year is, is how can we get the word of the Lord out to the community. And so this is open to, to all women, um, any age. Uh, it's about an hour, hour and a half commitment once a month. Um, and we would love to have you. We are actually starting a new mission outreach. And so we are we're trying to see if we have a need for a cancer outreach ministry. And so what we're looking for is we've prepared a, a few um, essentially care kits for, for people who have been recently diagnosed with cancer or who are who are in the process of undergoing treatment. And so instead of dropping these bags off at a hospital, um, we're wanting to make it a very personal um, gift for them and to let them know that the folks at Gravely Baptist Church, that it's, it's the women on mission and that they have very specific people tied to them um, that are behind them and praying for them. So our request for you is if you know anyone in your, your family, anyone at your workplace, um, a friend, neighbor, colleague, anything like that that has recently been diagnosed with cancer um, or is in the process of going through treatments, uh, please reach out to us. Let us know. We have a, a basically a care package that we would like to give to them. Um, it has a little lap blanket on them to keep them warm when they're taking some treatments, um, a, a hat, some lip gloss, some dry mouth lozenges, some, some couple little snacks. Um, and we also have a, a prayer cross in there with them and some devotional material. And the, the cross is made with wood from the Holy Land. And so that is something that we are, are essentially just wanting to reach out to people and let them know that um, you know, while they're going through this really dark time in their life, uh, they're not alone. Um, the Lord is in control. Uh, he's capable of all things. And that they have people and a community around them that are praying for them and there to support them. So... If you have someone that you know of, you have a name that kind of instantly popped you in, into your head, please let us know. This is stuff that we're doing for free. There's no cost um, to the person or, or to you. We just need a name and an address, um, and, and we'll go from there. So uh, please be thinking of that just as you go throughout your week. If you hear someone, just please jot down that name, let us know, and we'd be happy to get the information out to them. Uh, we are trying to start this mission um, outreach. If it's something that the Lord intends for us to do, uh, you know, he'll provide the people that need these packages, and if not, uh, we'll look for the next mission opportunity. So, with that being said, uh, we meet Tuesday at 6 p.m., so any, any Lord-made female is welcome to join any, any age. So, uh, thank you for that, Tim. Great. I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, CJ. What a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the WOM is such a, a strong ministry or a strong group within the church, and, and CJ definitely appreciate that piece of it and encourage everyone to be able to, to, to join that. Uh, a couple of other announcements. Um, yesterday during the cleanup, we found a lot of books um, that with multiple books. So back here by the kitchen, there's a table set up with a lot of books um, that we're just giving away. And so feel free after the service to walk back there, look through. There's a lot of good information uh, a lot of good study materials and those type of things. So we encourage you all to do that. 
One other announcement is that a reminder after our service this morning, we're going to have a called business meeting, and that's going to be to vote on the pastor search committee. And so we encourage members and um, interested people just to stay, uh, stay afterwards as we do that piece. And then the final item that I have um, before we go into prayer is that school starts tomorrow for a lot of a lot, lot of school systems. I think the Kingsport City starts tomorrow. I think the county teachers start back tomorrow. Uh, I think Virginia, they may be starting in the next week or two. I'm not sure about Hawkins County and things, but it's that time of year. It's obviously back to school time. And we want to recognize um, students, uh, teachers, administrators, anyone that's involved with schools. If you would, please stand so that we can recognize you at this point. All right, kids, step up. Laura Beth, my daughter. <laughs> there we go. Um, you know, but we just want to recognize all of you all, and, and we definitely want to pray for you all. And then also, we want to recognize if anyone has any specific prayer requests this morning, we always like to identify people with special needs and prayer requests. Please raise your hand so that we can identify that piece as well. Uh, but let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started on this Sunday morning. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and thank you for your son, Jesus. That's why we're here this morning, dear Lord, is to, to worship and to praise and to lift him up this morning, dear Heavenly Father. And just thank you that we can come together and we can have this time of fellowship and we can have this time that we can learn and we can hear from you. And we just pray for the Holy Spirit to move freely among the congregation today and touch our hearts, dear Lord, with the music that's going to be sung and the, the preaching that we're going to hear this morning, dear Lord. Just allow us to, to be in tune with you this morning, dear Lord, and that we can really focus in on you and the Holy Spirit. And this morning, we want to pray specifically for schools. We want to pray for administrators. We want to pray for teachers. We want to pray for the students. We want to pray for parents, um, anyone that's involved with schools, Heavenly Father. And um, we know that's, that's a tough field. That's a tough profession to be in now, dear Heavenly Father. And we just ask that you be with the teachers, that you be with the administrators, and just allow them to have that strength and that courage and the opportunity to to reach these kids and to talk to kids and, and to work with them and there may be opportunities to be able to share the gospel and we know that may go against what people are supposed to do but we also know that you call us to be witnesses to you and that we need to testify about your truth and the holiness that you have dear lord and we just pray for teachers administrators and the students be with all the kids as they start back protect them watch over them keep them safe dear lord and bless them be with all their relationships, dear Lord, and just allow this to be a blessed school year. And think about the church, dear Lord, with Gravely and how we can better work with schools and work with our teachers, dear Lord, to be able to spread the gospel. Give us those opportunities. Allow us to reach out and to be able to touch people through you, dear Lord. But we thank you for all this this morning, dear Lord. Be with our service. Just watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope you all are ready to worship this morning. If you'll please stand, we're going to sing How Great Is Our God this morning. We do have a great God, amen? Let's worship Him. Yeah. 
me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all Great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. We're going to sing this old song together. Precious Lord, take my hand. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night. seated. we got a song we're going to share with you this morning. If you know it, sing it with us. Because He Lives. Oh, the sun away. 
Children's Church, Miss Sarah's back there. You can join her. Good morning. <laughs> that over number two <laughs> sorry <laughs> Long Silence, 
until you come and stay a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulder. You raise me up to more. Than I can be. The decade of the 1920s were, came, came to be known as the Roaring Twenties, and it was a decade where social and cultural features helped define living more than the agrarian society and the frontier uh, society and life that Americans were known for. During that decade, mass production of technology brought about affordability to the middle and lower classes of America. I'll give an example, the radio, for instance. All right? I don't remember the radio being invented. Terry Bennett does, and he's told me this. But uh, the radio brought about mass broadcasting, and even though it wasn't affordable in the 1920s, it became a place where that neighbors would come from miles and listen. Mass broadcasting occurred. The television during the 1920s had advancement that brought about the world's first color television transmission. Along with a long-distance television signal of about 500 miles, it was transported to, it, to TVs in the area. Other inventions that changed America, the Band-Aid, came about in the 1920s. A man invented the Band-Aid because his wife burned herself cooking. They had open flames back then, and he tried to find somebody that would stop the, the infections. Water skis. Anybody like to water ski? Water skis was invented in the 1920s. The electric blender. The automobile was mass produced during the 1920s. Henry Ford came to figure out how to do that, and along with the mass production of automobiles, garages came about. People had to learn how to fix automobiles. 
And in the middle of the 20s, on July 5th, 1925, there was a 17-year-old teenager who was a good mechanic that picked up a New Testament in a garage in Knoxville, Tennessee. And he had been wrestling with the question, what am I going to do with my life? So many teenagers today wrestle with that question. They graduate high school, move into the workforce or to college, and they still ask, what am I going to do with my life? I'm 54, and I still ask that question. What's the next chapter of my life? Lord, what do you have out there for me that's different from what I'm doing right now? Everybody struggles with that. Well, Bill Wallace read that New Testament, and he concluded that the question he needed to ask was, what do I think I need to do with my life, but what would the Lord have me to do with my life? So Bill Wallace concluded that he was to be a medical missionary. So he enrolled at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. He did well there, and he went to the medical school in Memphis. About the same time, Dr. Robert Badal was the administrator of the Stout Memorial Hospital in Wuchow, China, and he pleaded with officials at the Foreign Mission Board that's now the Southern Baptist International Mission Board. He said, I need medical help. Send doctors over here. About that same time, Bill Wallace sent a letter to the Foreign Mission Board, and he said this, what he wrote. I must confess I'm not a good speaker nor apt as a teacher, but I do feel God can use my training as a physician. As humbly as I know how, I want to volunteer to serve as a medical missionary under our Southern Baptist Foreign Mission Board. And he was appointed July 15, 1935, which was 10 years to the day from him questioning in that garage in Knoxville. Marcella sung that song, God Raises Us Up. He raises us up for a purpose. He raises us up for a reason. So Bill Wallace went over to serve in Wuchow, China. In 1950, the Korean War broke out. Bill Wallace was questioned by communist officials, and he said, we're just doctors and nurses and hospital staff engaged in healing the suffering and sick in the name of Jesus Christ. We're here for no other reason. The missionaries were no longer welcomed in China. When the Korean War broke out, it sparked an intense anti-American propaganda campaign in China, so Bill Bill Wallace was arrested in December of that year after authorities found a gun under his bed. They accused him of being a spy. Bill Wallace was subjected to sleepless nights and relentless beatings until he was forced to make a confession under the threat of death. For his faith, he was mocked and tortured. His colleagues said he was poked and jabbed with bamboo sticks, and he died less than two months later in the jail. On February 10, 1951, Bill Wallace was found hanging from a crossbeam in his, fish, in his prison cell. The official record in China was that Bill Wallace killed himself amidst his guilt against the people of Wuchow, China. Colleagues went in to, and were permitted to take his body, and they reported they found very little traces of hanging, but more evidently, there were numerous body marks that indicated horrific physical abuse. Bill Wallace was tortured. He was persecuted. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 10. Jesus explains, as you're turning, I'm going to read it. He said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He was talking about Bill Wallace, and he was talking about all the other people who would be tortured and persecuted for the name of Christ. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 11. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, let me tell you what this is not. I've seen Christians who were positively obnoxious in witnessing, and you have too. They're aggressive and they get insulting and condescending when they witnessed. I was at a pastor's conference years ago. I went to a subway to eat, and while I was there, a prominent pastor came in with friends of his, and he began harassing the young girl at the counter. And I can remember thinking, that's really not appropriate. And you could tell she wasn't comfortable, but he was trying to get her to come to church. And after I watched her, I watched her co-workers who were horrified. But those preachers were like, yeah, we're doing God's will right now. And so before he left to go sit down, he handed the young girl a few dollars, and I thought, man, I'm sorry That's nothing but being a jerk. And there are Christians today, they like to get that way in witnessing, and that's not what we're supposed to do. We we see people who claim Christ, and by their methods, however good their intentions are, they create persecution, and there's no blessedness with that persecution. All right? Jesus didn't say, blessed are those who are persecuted for being weird and obnoxious. Rejection is a mark of blessing only when it's for the sake of righteousness. So if you're persecuted for the sake of righteousness, Jesus said you're blessed. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. We talked last week about righteousness, and there's different types, and they're going to put a slide up. I just want to point these out to you again. There's three different types of righteousness, I believe, based off of Scripture. There's legal righteousness, there's moral righteousness, and there's social righteousness. Our legal righteousness has, has to do with us being justified or considered right with God. In other words, that's our relationship with the Lord. In Jesus Christ, I'm redeemed, and you are too. Okay? There's nothing I can do to, get, to be justified other than follow Him. That's it. Okay? It's not a matter of what I can give to the church or, or my time I can commit or all the good works. Only through Christ we can be made righteous. So if we're persecuted for being legally righteous, Jesus said you're blessed. That's where we can say there's none righteous. No, not none. But here's what we do in church. We'll say there's none righteous, no, not none, so we won't even attempt the other two righteousness. That's an excuse that we hide behind. But the other two, there's moral righteousness, okay? If the quality of our lives, our conduct and motives towards others has not been renewed as a, as a, as a result of coming to Christ, then something's badly wrong. You've had a failed Christianity. Let me ask you, what's your thoughts towards the people that you don't like? Everybody has people they don't like. Do you? I do. I got people I can look at and think, yeah, I don't care if I ever come in contact with them again in this life, but Lord bless them wherever they are, okay? <laughs> That's right. Hallelujah on that. <laughs> what about different races? Do you harbor ill feelings just because of the color of somebody's skin? That's not right. I'll just tell you, racism is not right, and it should be dead in America. It should be dead in America. What about people in church you don't like? We all have those people, don't we? I can show up on Wednesday night, bless Morris is here. Hallelujah. You know. <laughs> Listen, camps form in the church. We're going to be voting on a, a search committee in a few minutes. All right? And I'm excited for the church in that, but I'm also a little trepid with that because I'm going, okay, that's when things can start happening. I want this person. I want that person. This person should apply, and that person should apply. And that shouldn't be in the church. Okay? We're going to talk when the search committee is voted on about how we should be praying for that. Let me tell you a way you can help alleviate that. The best way to overcome some ill feelings sometimes is spending time with people. Yesterday, there was a group that came here. You probably noticed when you came into church how clean the church was. A group came in here and worked what? How long, Lori, yesterday? About eight hours, okay? I'd like if you help yesterday in that, in that effort. Would you stand up? You came and helped you. Yeah. Good man. Yeah. That's exactly right. Thank you all for your efforts. That's a great opportunity when something like that's happening. Well, I can't do a whole lot more, so I can't lift things. Well, you can come and go handle somebody a bottle of water. Something. That's a great, that's a great opportunity to come and just be a part of. That's how you get to know each other, just by spending time, okay? Well, that's our moral righteousness spurs us to do those things. The WOM that uh, was talked about at the beginning. Some of you women, the Lord's going to put on your heart, show up Tuesday night, okay? Awana's on Wednesday night. Do you need help, Tina? Yeah, you need help on Wednesday night. They need people just to listen to Bible verses. They need all types of help. 180, do y'all need help on Wednesday night? Food pantry, do you need help on Thursdays? Nobody from food pantry here. You need help? Absolutely, okay? You get involved with church to get to know church people. That's how you form bonds, Okay, I encourage you to do that when things are happening. If we have a dinner, show up on a Sunday night. It ain't long. Just come and be a part of it. It's important to do those things. Sunday school. That's when we, have the, when we are propelled to do those things, that's the Spirit pushing us with our moral righteousness. You see somebody out at the, at the store and you go, I may need to pay for their groceries. That's, the, that's that moral righteousness propelling you. You're in pals. Okay, I went through pals about six months ago. And the lady paid for my food, and I thought, well, bless her heart, I'll pay for the people behind me. I said, hey, honey, I'm going to pay for them behind me. She said, get them next time. Theirs is $36. <laughs> bless you on that. I'll do it next time. <laughs> That's that moral righteousness, okay? If you're, if you're in Christ, okay, we need to be doing that moral righteousness. We need to be doing the things for the kingdom, all right? Then there's social righteousness. That's not at the personal level, but the community level. Jeremiah said in, in chapter 29, verse 7, he said, and seek the peace of the city. Seek for the city to get better. And that's just not the municipal government. That's this community right here. That's the county government. That's the U.S., okay? We ought to find ways that we can play our part as citizens of our country in giving a voice for injustice, okay? 
Christians should be the ones sounding the alarm on that. So based on, I think, interpretation, we can say that each of these righteousness areas is what Jesus was talking about. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Okay? So what is persecution? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I looked up dictionary definitions, and most of them say that to persecute is to harass or punish in a manner designed to injure or to grieve or to afflict, specifically to cause suffering over a long period of time because of somebody's race, religion, or political beliefs. I think persecution can go a step further to say when there's risk of, of confiscation or destruction of property, arrest, imprisonment, beatings, torture, murder, and executions, or the person's life is being threatened, that's being persecuted. Okay, you're afraid for your life. So Jesus told this to the disciples on the hillside. About 30 years later, in 64 AD, the Roman emperor Nero began to persecute Christians. And you can go back and read the history, but Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, documented Roman history during this time. Here's what he wrote. He talked about Christians was a small sect in Rome, that had followed this man 30 years before that Pontius Pilate, who was the governor, had uh, put to death. Okay? So he, T Tacitus said Christians died in torments during this time, and their torments were embittered by insult and derision. Listen to this persecution. Some were nailed to crosses. Others were sewn into skins of wild beasts and exposed to the fury of dogs. Can you imagine Others, again, smeared over with combustible materials while alive and used as torches to illuminate the darkness of night. These early Christians were persecuted for the name of Christ. That's persecution, just as Bill Wallace was killed for the name of Christ. Do we go through persecution in the 21st century? Not to that extreme. I don't know if I've ever been persecuted for the name of Christ. Made fun of? Sure. Ask, why are you doing that? That's just empty. Sure. But really persecuted? Well, let me tell you, it can happen in America. I can take you back 90 years. 90 years when a leader arose espousing a nationalism in which allegiance to the state came in response to a strong economy. Go back and read about Germany. Morality was dictated by the laws of the state. The people, were, the people, the people allowed the state to begin scrubbing Christianity from their landscape. And history tells us in, in Germany, carols and nativities were banned from schools. Christmas was changed to Yuletide. Next time you hear we're celebrating Yuletide, you need to stop that. We're celebrating Christmas. That we're, we're representing the, the birth of Christ. There were calls by the government for the Christian cross to be removed from churches, from cathedrals, chapels, and replaced by the national symbol of the swastika. And that happened in a lot of churches. Christ was replaced and Hitler's picture was put up in the church. So we can look back in World War II and see persecution which occurred against a Christian church in Germany. And this was an intellectual people. One of the most, I think, arguably, most intelligent people that's ever been in the world. And they fell in line because of a good economy. You understand what I'm saying, folks? That can happen very quickly. Blessed are they which are persecuted for the sake of right, for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. And in both those verses, Jesus says, blessed. Blessed is a Greek word, makarios, and I'm not going to define it like I did last week, but put it up on the screen, guys, the little definition. Blessed means inward circumstances, it's not affected by, inward contentedness, it's not affected by circumstances. Do you get that? Doesn't matter my home, I'm happy, I'm satisfied. Doesn't matter my car, and I drove some junkers in my time. You know what I'm saying? I drove, I had a car one time, I was in college, and it wouldn't go in reverse. Had a hole in the floorboard. I found that out when I was going up through there with a white shirt on for a presentation. I hit a mud puddle. <laughs> yeah, for real. Wouldn't go in reverse. Let that be a challenge on a college campus, finding a place you can't back up to, to get out. Okay. Inward contentedness that is not affected by circumstances. Can, so can I, let me just be a little honest with you, a little more than maybe normal. I'm having back issues again. Don't know what happened. Is that me? I've been shot. <laughs> Hello? Let's use this one, guys. Maybe an Angie shoot me saying she's pregnant again. <laughs> Believe me, I didn't live that down, okay? Still yet. It's a point of conversation around our dinner table. So, 
right way to talk about being persecuted. <laughs> but I'm having back trouble again, all right? A li- little bit. My legs, upper back, I'm having some issues, different place right now. But the reason I'm telling you that is not for sympathy. Pray for me. I'm having scans again with Duke. But here's the thing that the Lord has taught me and is teaching me. Is teaching me as in it's happening all the time. Don't worry about 10 years from now. Don't worry about tomorrow. The more it's your job, your secular job, you've got to plan for the next three to five years, but don't get so hung up about you personally. Don't get wrapped up three years from now. Let's live today, all right? Because tomorrow's got enough trouble, Jesus said. Don't worry about tomorrow. Let that take care of itself. <laughs> worry about, and it's kind of bizarre in my life because that's the way that I'm tracking right now. I'm going, I'm, and you know, I'm right now looking and I hate, I didn't get to come to the clean up yesterday because my schedule all week long, Saturday mornings is the time I spend finishing up my sermon. I got a little behind and I had to do that. But very rarely does that occur. Most of the time I've got things just fitting. Lord, you've extended the day today. That's wonderful. And I'll come home sometime to sit, sit in the chair to relieve. But you know what? I'm going, I ain't going to worry about tomorrow. He's teaching me, and I think this message is as much for me in these series of messages as it is for anybody in the congregation. Bless it. Are you blessed? Do you allow your inward contentedness to not be affected by outward circumstances? Don't worry about that stuff. Be content right now. Why? Because I'm in Christ. He loves me. And when I get a little down, I think, look at all the blessings I've got. My goodness. On my worst day, people would swap with me in a heartbeat, and they would you too. Bless it. Enjoy this particular point in time. But Jesus said, blessed are they which are persecuted. Well, that'd be a great visitation program theme, would it not? Go out and tell people they're going to be persecuted, but let's win them to Christ. (laughs) That'd be like going to a car lot and saying, I want to buy a car, and the salesman gets in with you and says, okay, I'm just going to tell you, man, three hours in this car, and you've got to go to physical therapy just to, get, just to get over it. And you know what? The amount of repairs you're going to pay for this car is going to put my three kids to college. You alone. I don't have to work anymore. And by the way, you driving that car down the road, everybody's going to turn their head and look at you because they're going to laugh at you for driving this car. Would you buy that car? No. That's just like saying, hey, come to Christ because blessed are they which are persecuted. No, Jesus isn't making a sales pitch in this beatitude. That's not what he's doing. He's not witnessing at this point in time. He's offering a word of comfort to his disciples because he knew they was going to be persecuted. And he knew that no normal person wants to be persecuted. I mean, this week, how many of you went out and said, hey, persecute me, I'll put a bullseye. You didn't do that. No. And it seems strange that Jesus would pass. Go back and look at verse 9. He goes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I can get that. That's the work of reconciliation. Then he goes to hostility. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He goes from one extreme to the other, from peacemaking to persecution. How many of you are peacemakers today? Real peacemakers. I want to show you a verse. I think this is where the church is. I think this is where America is. Proverbs 18.2. Put it up on the screen. A fool does not delight in understanding but only in revealing their own mind. Now, how many of us has posted something on Facebook that we didn't really know is true, but amen, we liked it. We didn't take time to evaluate, is it truth that I'm getting ready to put out there? We don't seek peacemaking or trying to understand. We just speak against. We're against this. Roe versus Wade. We're against abortion. I am too. But what are we doing now that abortion is no longer legal? Are we talking anything about how child support laws need to be strengthened? How the man needs to be held accountable? Are we talking anything about that? No, we're just thank God that he's turned us in the right direction. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only revealing what's in their own mind. Look at what Jesus says next. He says, blessed are those that are persecuted. He tells us what Christianity is really supposed to be. Look at verse 13. This is the essential character of the disciple in Christ. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. It's a very interesting teaching here, all right? Christians can wield a healthy impact on the world, but most of us sit back and say, well, what can the meek and the poor do? And what can the mourners do? 
And those who try to make peace and not war, and most will say that those characteristics are too, too feeble to achieve anything. But let me frame it up this way. What can Christians who desire righteousness do to impact our world? Our world that is evil. He uses two metaphors, salt and light. He uses two metaphors that the poor could understand here, okay? How important is light? Well, just keep the light cut off at night when you go to the bathroom, man. See what happens, okay? you got to have that light. Light is very important, but salt is needed as well, okay? Salt has a variety of uses, and it seems that throughout history, salt's been used to season food. Job says, the oldest book of the Bible, we think, Job wrote this, can something tasteless be eaten without salt? So I would suspect that salt's probably at the top of the list of common things used in our world. What it teaches us is that when we see, see others, our lives should speak to those people in a good-natured manner and attractive that's characterized by seasoning people's life. Okay, you get that? He says be salt of the earth. That should start here in the church. That's a reason to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We should practice here to go out in the world. I have thought this, a lot, a lot of people, and you may think this, this is a place we ought to bring lost people to get saved. No, lost people should get saved in the world and then come here. This here is like a halftime of a football team. We come in and we get situated just right and we get corrected and we learn the word and then we go out there in the third quarter and do it better than we did in the second quarter. That's what church is supposed to be. We practice here. As salt on the earth, Jesus' followers are to season the earth with their presence, making it a better place to be. So let me ask all of us to ask, when was the last time we seasoned somebody's life? When was the last time you provided hope for somebody? When was the last time you were just an ear for somebody to talk? I'm not a good listener because I'm always looking to butt in. You know what I'm saying? I had somebody tell me, hey, Morris, the best thing to do is let the silence hang there for two seconds before you say something. That's a great practice. Listen to people. Most people just want to be heard anyway. Am I right? Just give them a voice to, okay, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I may not agree with you, but I hear. When was the last time you were eyes to see a clear path? Hey, let me give somebody advice on maybe going down this route right here. When was the last time you, or I was, when was the last time you or I were the hands that was used to provide compassion? Or we were the feet that carried people to another path to walk? Or we were just not critical of something? I get real hung up sometimes with being critical. That ain't how this needs to be done. Do it this way over here. I was in a meeting this week. <laughs> I felt bad after the meeting. I walked into a meeting, and I right off the bat spoke up and said, that we're going to. had an employee come to me, and she said, we've been working on this for three weeks, and you didn't give us an opportunity. You just, I'm bad about that. Being seasoning means we help encourage each other. We give people just that small word of encouragement. Okay, Back in this day, there were no refrigerators or freezers. Okay, So they had to take salt and use it to... Uh, be a preservative so that things didn't spoil. So salt not only enhances f flavor, but it prevents rot. So when Jesus says, ye are the salt of the earth, I think he's saying this world is decaying rot all around us, and we can be the factor that makes things alive again. Now, before you get all spiritual on me and say, well, bless God, it's Jesus. It ain't us. Well, he says we're his feet and hands. We're his eyes. We carry things the way it needs to be gone. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, trampled underfoot by people. Let me put it this way. When's the last time you made anybody smile? Is that not a good feeling? Just provide a little respite from somebody? When's the last time you complimented somebody and you gained nothing from that compliment? We like to put the charisma on and butter people up. You know what I'm saying? Wow, you look nice today. That really looks good on you. Yeah, what are you wanting from me today? <laughs> Christians hold a mitts opportunity each day, but our Christian culture today squanders those opportunities. We get so wrapped up with ourselves to slow down to see those in need of healing and salting around us. So we can be salt shakers. You want a good thought? Be a salt shaker. I got some watermelon the other night. Went to the cabinet. We didn't have no salt in our salt shaker. So I put the watermelon back in the fridge and went to Food City and got me some salt. <laughs> like, I want that watermelon. And it made it better, okay? Well, when was the last time we were salt shakers to anybody? 
or we're flamethrowers. We'll just blow somebody up. Be a salt shaker. Jesus said, you are the salt. You, we are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty or good? It is good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot of people. I'm going to ask you, and I'm trying to weigh this up. Is that where the church is today? We become tasteless. We've been thrown out, and the world's trampling us underfoot, and we're screaming. We want to go to our Christian concerts, and we want to listen to WX, WCQR and all those things, but as long as it's focused on us. But wait, salt focuses on the other thing. That salt got no benefits out of me eating it the other night, none whatsoever, other than just enhancing my experience. That's what a Christian should do. You are the salt of the earth. Then look what he says in verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and give it light to all those who are in the house. Your light must shine before people in such a way that you may see your, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You are the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Later, Jesus would say that, I am the light of the world. But by an offshoot, we're shining the light of Christ in this world. I think we're shining in a world like stars. It's so dark today, so dark. I've talked with Christian business leaders who have strong Christian beliefs, but when it comes to how they treat their people, they don't treat them too good. You've got to hold your people accountable regardless. I'm not going to tolerate and put up. You can't trust anybody. If you hire them, they better be, by God, they better meet my expectations. And I'm stepping back going, what if we just treated people as humans? Let me understand, you got something going on too, and I do as well. My back has taught me that over three years. I used to say, leave all your problems at the door when you come to work, and I'm going, I can't do that. I carry them with me every single day wherever I go, but what I can do is be salt and light and lighten somebody else's load. Stop and think just a second. This is for all of us. You got, those of you who are working, you got somebody at work you just don't like. You go into school, you got somebody at school you just don't like. Am I right? Somebody amen me on that, okay? That's right. We're all in that boat. Stop and think and pray today. Hey, Lord, tomorrow, how can I be salt and light to that person? I promise you, your outlook will be different tomorrow when you go to work. If you truly pray that and ask the Lord to do that with you. Let me be, he told the disciples, you're going to be persecuted. I bet nobody said, hallelujah, we're going to, but then he said, but hey, you're the salt and you're the light of the world. That's where the light is. Grace exhibits, grace exhibited when someone needs it rather than being judgmental. In church, we are way too judgmental with people today. You may not think so, but we are. Let me read to you Romans chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse 1. This is what, Romans is a book Southern Baptists love to go to because, bless God, it talks about homosexuals. We'll just go quote that verse, but how about this one? Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not have quarrels over opinions. He's talking about inside the church. Now, accept the one who is weak in the faith, but not to have quarrels over opinion. I know a church, I was in a church that had a split one time because a guy got up and said, bless God, Jesus had the Last Supper on Friday night rather than Thursday night. And people jumped on camps on that side. And I'm going, seriously? <laughs> We're fussing about that. I mean, come on. Then he says in verse 10, but as for you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you as well, why do you not regard your brother or sister with contempt? Why do you regard your brother or sister with contempt? For we will all appear before the judgment seat of God, every one of us. And when I stand there before the Lord, ain't none of y'all going to be standing beside of me, I can tell you that. I'm there just me and him, and you're going to be the very same way. Next time you want to judge out and judge some, I can't believe they went to this place, or they talked like that, or they did this, stop. He says, accept the one who is weak in the faith, but not to have quarrels over opinions. Verse 22 in Romans 14, the faith you have, have as your own conviction before God. There are essentials and non-essentials in the faith. Essentials I'm not, going to be, I'm not going to compromise on. Jesus is the Son of God and He is God. He was, he was crucified and He resurrected on the third day. He was born of a virgin. He saved me and I've got access to God. Those are essentials. But there are non-essentials Christians are going to disagree about and the best thing to do is just to pray for each other rather than judging. 
Doesn't matter some of the things that we get all wound up tied about. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. That scripture has become popular. It was cited at the end of a sermon by a Puritan pastor, John Winthrop, as he delivered a message before he and his fellow settlers reached New England. He called it a model of Christian charity. And Winthrop warned his fellow Puritans that their new community here in America would be as a city upon a hill and the eyes of all people in the world are upon us. Meaning, if the Puritans fail to uphold their covenant with God, their sins and errors will be exposed for all the world to see it. So he encouraged them to remember that. And I thought if us in the church would just get back to that. Our actions every single day speak to people much better than our words do. Our actions of how we treat people, our actions of how we conduct business, all that. And Jesus goes on to say, people can't light a lamp and put it under a basket, or on a lamp, uh, but on a lampstand, and they give it light for all who are in the house to see. So we have this thought in, in the evangelical life that the only good works we can do is openly evangelize and tell people that they're lost. But the Beatitudes and this Sermon on the Mount is about Christian living. Look at verse 16 of Matthew 5. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Can I give you some practical ways to let our light shine? Just a few things. First is show grace with words. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. When speaking with people, we should use words that are kind and gentle. Obviously, there's times we've got to correct people, all right? But it never has to be done in a hateful or mean-spirited way. Do you hear me, Christian? I'm reminded of that all throughout the week. Sometimes I get a little wound up. You know, I didn't, I didn't order sweet tea. I got plain tea coming through pals. Now, you gave me, you know, I got to come all the way back. Stop, okay? Find a way to say what you got to say gently. Show grace with your words. Is your word salt and light, or do they spew darkness? So show grace with words. Second way is look for the needs of other people. This is just a few things. Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. That's not the big things necessarily. Can be. That's the small things. Hold the door open for somebody who's got their hands full. That can be a small action, but it's a big thing that can happen. Let a person over in traffic that's got their signal light on. Well, I'll tell you what, they knew just like me that line was going to close. That line was going to close. I ain't letting them over. Get right up behind. No, uh-uh. Then you got Gravely Baptist Church on your car tag. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe if you're blessed, pay for somebody else's meal in a restaurant. That can be a great blessing. All right. Just a small thing. All right. Next thing, we can respond to people with grace. Colossians 4, 6 says, Your speech must always, I read this earlier, be seasoned with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. We've all been criticized, am I right? Sometimes unjustly, correct? Okay? You don't have to let people walk all over you, but you can respond in a gracious manner as a Christian. A quick, a quick response with anger can leave a seething and do more damage in a relationship than just giving it 24 hours before you respond to somebody. Have a graceful presence. That's something all Christians can do. You don't have to be called to have a graceful presence. Aaron gave a blessing to the Israelites in Numbers chapter 6. Verse 25 is the one I'm going to focus on. But in 24 he says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace. Verse 25 says, The Lord calls his face to shine on you and be gracious. You remember the story where Moses was up on the mount? He was getting the law, and he came back down, and everybody was wigged out. Whoa, what's going on with you? It's like he'd been plugged into electricity. He shined all over, and Moses didn't know that. But he had been with God, and the people knew that. You know, one reason we don't have a graceful presence, we're not around the Lord during the week. We come in on Sunday morning. I've done my Christianity. I've done my good. I've listened to that guy for 30, 40 minutes, and I'm ready to go home now. But we don't live Christianity out. We're not salt and light during the week. We can use those words. Let me read it again. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. Is he gracious to you? Because he sure is to me every single day. The Lord lift, you, lift, lift up his face to you and give you peace. 
You can use these verses as a reminder of our conduct with other people. Take the opportunity to be with somebody in a time of grief. Just go sit with them and listen to them. Just be there. They don't need you to deliver some special speech or anything grand for them and the family. I think I shared this with you all. I got called by a funeral home to do a um, funeral of a baby, an infant that was just born. And I'll be honest, that's one of them times I said, Lord, what do I say to them to comfort them? What, what can I do? I just went in there and prayed with them and said, hey, you know, I don't know why this, went, why this had to happen. We sometimes as preachers, I think Terry and Tony and Mark, and he, we think we got to have this spiritual answer. Bless God, I'm on all the time, and I can tell you exactly why this had to, You don't know. But I, can t- I told them this, God loves you. Jesus died for you. He loves you as an individual. He loved that little baby, and this didn't catch him by surprise. Just have a graceful presence. I have to work on that. In, in the time of social media, just a quick text or a Facebook message can encourage somebody. Just a quick hello can mean the, the world to them in their time of physical or emotional grace. Hey, how about this? How about forgiving people with grace? Colossians 3 says, bearing with one another, it means putting up with one another, and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so must you do also. In addition to all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ, to which, to which you were indeed called in one body, rule in your hearts and be thankful. When somebody asks for forgiveness, accept it and go on. And let me tell you what forgiveness is not. Okay, I had a situation one time where I said something. I didn't mean it the way it sounded, but somebody got offended. And, I'm not, and listen, I don't do this a lot, so I'm not saying this, I'm up on a pedestal. But I went to that person, I said, hey, I'm sorry to you, I apologize. My initial default was to say, I'm sorry, but I didn't mean to say it that way, or I'm sorry, and I want to put a caveat on it. You put a caveat on an apology, is it really an apology? It's not. Just as the Lord forgave you, you must also do. In fact, he says, forgive us as we forgive other people. That's what he said in the Lord's Prayer. So when somebody asks forgiveness, accept it graciously. And I've got it written down this way. Keep short accounts. When you need to apologize, do it quickly. Don't keep a running total of how many times they've done wrong against you. Husbands and wives are the worst with that. Remember the last time we was talking about this? And now here you are again. You know, Forgive even if they don't ask for it. Grace can go a long way into repairing a relationship. And if you respond in a loving way even when they don't need it or they don't deserve it, that's grace. Because I didn't deserve the grace he showed on me when I was a seven-year-old boy at Pleasant View. But he said, I'm going to shower you with grace. Here's the last one. Say thanks to show grace to other people. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. And it doesn't say give thanks to God in this verse. It just says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. So take, take the time to say thank you. That didn't cost anything, but it can show other people gratitude and grace. Write a simple card. I'll I'll be honest. I think Hallmark is about the most wasted industry you can have. You want to come Mother's Day, an anniversary, here I am, and Valentine's Day, and all those other holidays, and I'm getting a card, and I'm going, I'm spending five or six dollars on something that she's going to look at and then put in a drawer. You're sitting there going, you're a fool, Morris. But you know how special it is to receive a handwritten card? Somebody took effort to go out of their day to get the card, to write down a message, put a stamp on it, and to mail it. That means so much, but we don't do that today. We don't take time to do those small things. Say thank you. Thank you. You can make a difference by just putting thank you on your lips and in a card to somebody's hand. Verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So my challenge this morning to you is how much of Jesus' light are you reflecting in this dark world? I read a story about a, uh, back in the horse and buggy days. And it was common, but a horse and buggy came up to railroad tracks and they didn't know it was tracks and a, and a train hit it. And it killed an entire family. And there was an investigation, and the man was questioned who was assigned to watch that particular crossing and warn people about the approaching trains. And they asked him in court, 
If he was crawling, if he was watching the crossing that night, I was. Did you see the train coming? Yes, it was right on time as always. Did you take your lantern and go out and meet it like you were supposed to? Yes, yes, Your Honor, I, I did that. Did you wave it back and forth to warn that the train was coming? Yes, I did. And that was the heart of the investigation. Any more questions? And the matter was closed. It was just an accident. Unfortunate accident just can't be explained. Years went by, and the watchman was on his deathbed. And he began to moan over and over, oh, those poor people, those poor people. And a friend said, what are you talking about? And the man said, there was this accident years ago. And the man said, and his friend said, yeah, I know. There was a careful investigation. You were completely cleared. He said, yeah, but there was one question they didn't ask me. They didn't ask me if my lantern was lit. If it had been lit, the family wouldn't have died. Folks, Jesus tells us to live righteous in our daily lives, to live those Christian attitudes. We're the salt that seasons the world and we're the light that shines on the one we're following. So is your lamp lit today? Is your light shining in the dark world? That's the light of Christ. By our actions, we go out and we shine that light every single day. I'll leave you with that. Let's pray. Father, we come to you thanking you for your word. And I pray for those that may be here whose light is not lit. Their lamp is dark. And I would pray that you would light that lamp today, Lord, and give people that desire to go out and just be a light to other people, to recognize people as humans. Maybe they need to have a lamp. Maybe you just need to let them understand they need to ask you into their life. Whatever the need is this morning, you made it because you're a great and awesome God. We love you just the way you are, and you love us just the way that we are. Continue to walk with us as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand, please. so it is now. Um, Averland's come up, and I'm going to let Mackenzie walk through what she has done, but needless to say, we're going to have a few baptizings coming up. All right? So. This is always a good day. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Averland was at home, and she had asked her mom and dad to just pray, and she accepted Jesus into her heart. And she, uh, she accepted him, and she is saved today. I'm very thankful for that. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm awful at getting put on the spot. My fumble over my words. But um, in a couple of weeks, we are going to have a baptize, and I'm going to get to baptize her, um, and it's going to be a good day. And I hate I'm emotional, too. But it is what it is. We're excited. We have another sister in Christ this morning. It's one more that's going to get to go to heaven. So um, we're going to have a baptize the next week, too. So good times here at Gravely Baptist Church. So as you leave today, if you'll just come up, and if you want to say something to Averlyn and congratulate her, that would be awesome. So I'm going to let Terry dismiss us in prayer. Okay, we are not going to be dismissed in prayer. Would you all go ahead and be seated? We're going to call ourselves in order at, to, uh, for a, small, a short business session with one item of business. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Mike Castle, Tim Peters, Terry Anderson, and Karen Patrick to come forward. And Christy Bagwell is also part of this committee, and uh, Christy is on vacation. She's not able to be here this morning. But uh, we are, I'm going to make a motion uh, from the deacons. You all just stand here in front. Uh, I'm going to make a motion from the deacons that we elect these five as our pastor search committee. Uh, through much prayer, we have came up with this committee. And I'm going to put that in form of a motion, and I'd like someone to second, and then we'll open the floor for Tommy Sproul's second. All right, does anybody have any questions concerning uh, this group of people? wanted you all to see the faces with the names so you'll know who your search committee is. Any questions about them, about the process? Now, they haven't even met yet, so they're not into anything right now, but they, uh, yeah. Okay, Terry's off the committee. And uh, so, 
they haven't even come together as a team yet. And uh, so they're just starting this process. But any questions for them? Anything at all? 